Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 130, and you can find that in your pew Bibles on page 573. This would be a great one to follow along with. It's a short psalm, just eight verses long, and we are going to go through every single verse together. So you might want to keep your Bibles handy uh, throughout the sermon so that you can refer back to it. Psalm 130, verses 1 through 8. A song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Psalm 130 is a psalm, among other things, about waiting. And so I'm reminded of the story of two brothers who were waiting at breakfast time and arguing over which one would get the first pancake. Well, their mother saw in this an opportunity for a little bit of a moral lesson. And so she told her boys, you know, if Jesus were sitting here right now, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Well, the two boys thought about this for just a moment. And then the younger boy turned to his older brother and said, okay, you be Jesus. We aren't very good at waiting, are we? We live in a world of instant gratification where if you want to watch a movie or a show, uh, you just have to find it and stream it on demand is what they call that. If you have a random question, you can ask Siri or Google or Alexa and get an immediate answer. If you want to talk to a friend who's in a whole different state or country, you can send an email or a text message and get an instantaneous response. If you want to go somewhere, you can jump in a car or in an airplane and you can go faster and farther than anyone could have even dreamed about throughout most of recorded history. And if, God forbid, you actually do have to wait in a line or maybe in that car or airplane on the way somewhere, there are still plenty of diversions to occupy your time while you wait. Interestingly, Psalm 130 may have been some kind of diversion like that too. The ascription right at the beginning of the psalm tells us that this is a song of ascents, as in to ascend. In Hebrew, it's shir hama'alot, which literally means a song of going up, which is what to ascend means. Now, there are 15 psalms with this kind of label in the book of Psalms, and they were probably meant to be sung by ancient travelers while they were making their annual or seasonal pilgrimage up to the holy city of Jerusalem, up to the temple on the top of Mount Zion. But whereas we often use our songs and our games and our movies to distract us while we are on our long journey, these ancient songs labeled songs of ascent and especially psalm 130 they would have worked in the opposite way they would have worked to focus the travelers on their destination and on the reason for the journey in the first place which was to come into the presence of god in the holy temple psalm 130 begins with the words out of the depths i cry to you o lord and this cry has a beautiful double meaning on a literal level, a journey to Jerusalem would have begun at a lower elevation than Jerusalem, perhaps somewhere near the depths of the sea or sea level and far away from 
the visible and tangible manifestation of God's presence, the temple. On a poetic level, the depths can also refer to our human condition, to our despair and our suffering, and to the time and place in our lives where we feel most distant from God and where we suddenly realize that if we're ever going to make it right, something needs to change. We need some kind of a spiritual journey or a pilgrimage to put things back together again. The psalmist continues in verse 2, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to, my, to the voice of my supplications. And that's the only prayer that's actually in the entire psalm. Lord, hear my voice. It's a simple prayer. And unlike other prayers we've heard in other psalms, it doesn't ask God to do something specifically to intervene in the psalmist's situation, to rain down vengeance on his enemies or rescue him in some way. It just is a cry for God to acknowledge, hear me, know that I exist. It's not a bad place to start in our prayers and in our journeys. God, I'm here. Remember me? But sometimes the hardest part of a journey, spiritual or otherwise, is getting out the door, right? Some of you made that journey this morning all the way to the sacred place of First Presbyterian Church, and it was hard to get out the door. We know that we need to go, but there's always something holding us back. Maybe it's fear of leaving something important behind. Maybe it's fear of the unknown dangers waiting for us on the road. Maybe it's fear that our destination will not be what we expect it to be. Or worse yet, fear that we ourselves will not live up to expectations. For the psalmist in Psalm 130, it's the fear that he is not worthy of his destination. He is not worthy of standing in the presence of God. He says in verse 3, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? In other words, if you, God, keep track of all our failures and all our wrongdoings, then I'm never going to get there. Nobody will. But then in the very next verse, he reminds himself, and he reminds God, that there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. That's a fascinating connection to me. I don't think we see this too often in the scriptures, the connection between God's forgiveness of us and our worship of him. Basically, the psalmist is saying, hey, God, you're the one who called us to come into your presence, who commanded us to worship you, who invited us to come to the sacred temple. You're the one who wanted us to come. But since you are holy and we are not, the only way this worship thing is ever going to work is if you forgive us. The only way we can, we can come into your presence is if you wipe clean that slate of all the things that we have done because we are not capable of doing that on our own. Going back to the metaphor of a journey, how many of you, when you get in your car and you get ready to drive down the road, focus your sights for the drive, on the rearview mirror, and only the rearview mirror. You're not going to go anywhere, at least not very safely, if you do that. You cannot move forward if you are chained to what's behind you, to the past, to your mistakes, and to your regrets. Yes, you can distract yourself from those things so that you forget about them for a short while, but only God can truly make all of those things disappear into oblivion. And that's exactly what God does when we set our course to come into his presence. So, what's next? We're out the door. We're on the road. We have been forgiven. We are excited about the journey. What do we do now? Verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word, I hope. This is the part we're not really good at, right? The waiting part. A man was praying to God one day, and he asked God, Hey God, how long is a 
billion years to you? And God replied, it's as if it had been one second to you. And then the next day, the man asked God, hey, God, how much is a billion dollars to you? And God said, it's like just one of your pennies to me. And the man said, God, can I have one of your pennies? And God replied, sure, wait just a second. Journeys take time and patience. Personal transformation takes time. And some journeys, some transformations can take an entire lifetime. But verse 5 of Psalm 130, right here at the heart of the psalm, gives us two pieces of amazing advice for how we are to pass that time on the journey and not wander off the path. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. The first piece of advice comes in the Hebrew word translated as soul, or nephesh is actually the Hebrew word there. When we think of the soul, a lot of times... Nefesh, soul. To us, that's some kind of ethereal, detached thing that when we die, floats around or maybe up to heaven, but it's not connected somehow or, or can be disconnected from our bodies. So the soul is a thing all unto itself. But that concept would have been completely strange to an ancient Hebrew person. That's something that actually came into our cosmology and our thinking from Greek and Roman religious traditions much later. For Hebrew peoples, the nephesh was simply the self, all of it. Your body plus your mind plus your emotions plus everything that adds up together to be you. And that's what the psalmist means when he says, my soul waits for the Lord. My nephesh waits for the Lord. All of me, myself, waits for the Lord. This is not a distracted kind of waiting, as in my brain is doing one thing, my hands are doing another thing, my mood is somewhere in between. This is rather a focused, directed, and poised kind of waiting. This is the kind of waiting that you do in the split second between the time when you trip over something and the time when you hit the ground. In that moment, your brain and your body are completely united in anticipating and preparing for the thing that's about to happen. That's waiting with your whole self. Now, I'm not going to lie. Waiting for the Lord with that kind of unified focus is difficult to do and even more difficult to sustain over a prolonged period of time. But I think we can begin to approach it if we start to cut out our distractions and all of the inner divisions that we subject ourselves to in the name of trying to not be bored, not wait, not focus. And in any case, the second piece of advice that we get from verse 5 can help us with the first. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits and in his word, I hope. If you want to find your way and you are lost, it helps to have a map or a GPS these days, which is just a digital collection of maps. If you want your business to succeed, it helps to have a good knowledge of your industry, of your business. It helps to have something like a strategic plan. If you want your relationships to succeed, it helps to have a good knowledge of the person you are trying to relate to. And if you want to focus your entire self on coming into God's presence, then God has already given you the map, the plan, the collected knowledge and wisdom of those who have embarked on that same journey for thousands of years before you. And that is 
God's word in which the psalmist places his hope. Prayer is great. Coming to church every Sunday morning is great. Being a good person and doing good things your whole life is great. But if you really want to move forward in your relationship and your journey to be closer to God, then commit yourself to being a student of God's Word. Not just for one hour every Sunday morning, but every day with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your self. Verse 6 repeats that refrain, but then it adds a contrast, a comparison. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. This is rare. Usually in Hebrew poetry, there's a lot of repetition, but it's repetition with variance. The fact that you get two lines here repeated that are identical makes me think that this is to really emphasize my soul waits for the Lord way more than those who watch for the morning. But what does that mean? Those who watch for the morning. I think it's a poetic way of saying those who focus merely on reacting to whatever happens next or those who are overly concerned with what the next day will bring and the day after that. Jesus said something very similar to this in Luke chapter 12. When he told his followers, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for it is the nations of the world that strive after all of these things. And your father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. In other words, don't wait for the morning. Wait for the Lord. And put your hope in the promises of his word, not in the promises offered by the world. Psalm 130 concludes with the psalmist looking beyond his own individual journey, beyond himself, and towards the collective journey of his people, the people of Israel. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. I think we would do well, like the psalmist, to remember that our own personal and individual journeys intersect and intertwine with countless others around us. And if we truly find hope and redemption in God's steadfast love, then that is something infinitely worth sharing to all of those people who are on the journey around us. Psalm 130 ends with hope, but I want you to notice something. It doesn't end with the psalmist arriving at his destination, as you might expect. That never happens in this psalm. There are other psalms which reflect that joyful entrance into Jerusalem, but not this one. This is a song for the road, for the journey, for finding fulfillment and contentedness and happiness in that progression closer and closer to God. Here at First Presbyterian Church, we often like to say that we are a church for wanderers, wonderers, and wisdom seekers. And all three of those things imply that we are imperfect, unfinished people, people who are on a journey, but on that journey together helping each other and encouraging each other along the way. We don't always agree on how to get where we're going or what kind of shoes to wear along the way or where to stop or not stop along the way, but we all are following the same set of instructions and we have all set our sights on the same final destination. So if you find yourself out in the depths longing to be closer to God, longing for the kind of love and forgiveness that only God can offer. And I hope you'll wander with us for a little while. And at the very least, I hope you will ask yourself this question every day. What, or maybe who, am I waiting for?